Good morning. Welcome to Mission Control Houston, where the Orbit 2 team of flight controllers is on duty this morning to monitor the operation of the systems on the International Space Station and assist Commander Drew Feustel and the Expedition 56 crew members with the science and maintenance tasks on their agenda. That agenda has included the first full week of science for the station's three newest crew members, as well as the deployment of a small satellite that's testing out methods of cleaning up low Earth orbit by capturing and removing small pieces of space junk. Houston Station on Space to Ground. Welcome to Space to Ground, I'm Gary Jordan. Space junk is a growing risk when it comes to spaceflight which is why a new experiment is looking at how to clean it up. The NanoRack's Remove Debris satellite was deployed from the space station's robotic arm this week. Remove Debris will look to manage space junk by literally pulling it down out of orbit to burn up in the atmosphere. Research has shown that removing the largest debris significantly reduces the chance of collisions. So Remove Debris will use a 3D camera to map the location and speed of debris. Then capture and deorbit simulated debris, CubeSats in this test, up to one meter in size. The experiment will test net capture, harpoon capture, vision-based navigation, and drag sail deorbit techniques for removing space junk. Experts here on Earth can analyze video from these runs to see what worked and find the best ways to clean up the space around us. Meanwhile, inside the station, the science was positively lit. This week, the crew spent some time cleaning soot from a previous flame test for the Advanced Combustion via Microgravity Experiments, or ACME. ACME aims to improve fuel efficiency and reduce pollution on Earth, and understand material flammability to further prevent spacecraft fires. With the burner cleaned, science operations for ACME are once again reignited on station. This week's question comes from Ava at RJO Intermediate School. She asks, how do you send materials from Earth to the space station? Great question, and the answer is simple. A rocket that carries a spaceship full of stuff into orbit. The International Space Station orbits 250 miles above the Earth and can't really come down to get more supplies, food, fuel, experiments, and equipment. Therefore, these supplies have to be delivered to the space station on separate vehicles. Think of them as delivery trucks, but they travel faster and higher. It takes a few days to arrive at the space station, and once it does, it has to be captured by the robotic arm to be moved into a position where it can be attached so astronauts can get to the good stuff inside. You can watch the launch of a cargo vehicle next week live, where SpaceX will be sending its Dragon cargo vehicle packed with thousands of pounds of cargo to the International Space Station. Keep sending in your questions using the hashtag space to ground And for those teachers out there, check out the latest episode of Stemonstrations, where astronaut Scott Tingle demonstrates the movement of objects around the Earth. We'll see you next week. Off the Earth, for the Earth. Space to ground. A tool that has helped guide sailors across oceans for centuries is now being tested aboard the International Space Station as a potential emergency navigation tool for guiding future spacecraft across the cosmos. The Sextant Navigation Investigation tests the use of a handheld sextant aboard the space station.
repairing the hardware for voyages out into space is only part of the International Space Station's mission of preparing for NASA's future flights of exploration. Scientists are using the station to find ways to protect human explorers from the negative effects of being in weightlessness and from the conditions they'll encounter on long trips into deep space, including galactic cosmic radiation that comes from supernovas. One of our biggest challenges on a mission to Mars is protecting the crew from radiation. You can't see it, you can't feel it, you don't know that you're getting bombarded by radiation, but we do have operational dosimetry and crew personal dosimeters that we can measure it. Space radiation comes from three major sources. One is there are radiation particles trapped around the Earth and they're called the Van Allen radiation belts. The second source of radiation is from the sun. During times of intense solar activity, there can be solar storms and high fluxes of radiation. Protons in particular can reach Earth. The third source of radiation in space is called galactic cosmic radiation, and that's the one that's of most concern for a mission to Mars. The galactic cosmic rays come from exploding stars that we call supernovas. So I think one of the common misconceptions about space radiation is just how different it is uh, from the type of radiation we have here on Earth. So here on Earth, when you think about sitting down in a dentist chair, they put uh, some kind of lead blanket on your chest to protect you, protect you against x-rays. In space, uh, it actually is very different. We don't want heavy materials because it makes the exposure worse. We want things like hydrogen, things like water, and polyethylene. The primary reason for that is in space, we have particle radiation instead of electromagnetic radiation. Particle irradiation is, is basically everything on the periodic table, hydrogen all the way up through nickel and uranium, but moving at speeds that are close to the speed of light. So thinking about the differences between Earth-based radiation and space radiation, we have a long history and, and a decent amount of data uh, about the biological consequences of uh, exposure to terrestrial radiation. Where we lack data and we have a, a large amount of uncertainty is the biological consequences of space radiation. Uh, and so really the next steps are, and, and the ongoing steps are to try to understand those exposures better and the biological consequences that follow them. In learning more about radiation and navigation and other aspects of the spaceflight, the International Space Station is helping us know more about what it'll take to make successful journeys out into the cosmos someday, to Mars and other destinations. Here are a few more examples of how the station is building the missions of the future. So you want to go to Mars. How does NASA's International Space Station help us extend human presence into deep space? In the future, when astronauts land on Mars, it will be thanks to some important lessons that we learned on the International Space Station. Rewind. 240 miles above the Earth, the International Space Station is where we currently live and work in space. Here's what we've learned so far. First, there's taking care of our astronauts. Prolonged weightlessness can lead to muscle and bone loss, vision changes, balance, and coordination loss. Thanks to the space station, countermeasures are being developed to keep astronauts healthy for long-duration missions. Then there's the equipment. Spacecraft communication, water recycling, air, and power production are all being test-driven on the International Space Station. What we learn about operating and maintaining our gear in the harshness of space will pave the way for future missions into our solar system. And that's how the space station is helping us extend human presence into deep space. For more information, visit this NASA website. Along with the research that's being done inside the International Space Station's many laboratory modules, the station also provides a platform for science targeting the Earth. Researchers who are trying to gain a better understanding of lightning and thunderstorms are using the station to study transient luminous events, which are storm-related phenomena that you cannot see from down here on Earth.
a display of lights above the storm. Presented by Science at NASA. In 2015, European Space Agency, or ESA astronaut Andreas Mogensen, was on board the International Space Station, or ISS, photographing the tops of thunderstorms from Earth orbit. And he saw something very interesting indeed. Blue jets. Blue jets are a type of transient luminous event, or TLE, flashes and glows that appear above storms that are results of activity occurring in and below those storms. Blue jets pulse from the tops of intense thunderstorms and reach up toward the edge of space. In January 2017, researchers at Denmark's National Space Institute published their analysis of his observations in geophysical research letters. Mogensen was able to capture clear video as the station flew over the Bay of Bengal, and they were amazed by what that video showed. Olivier Chanrion, lead author of the publication, reported that during 160 seconds of video footage, 245 pulsating blue discharges were observed, corresponding to a rate of about 90 per minute. One of the blue jets observed reached 25 miles, or 40 kilometers, above sea level. Visual evidence of TLEs wasn't available until 1989. Early evidence included red sprites photographed by cameras on board the space shuttle, and photographs taken during a NASA and University of Alaska airborne campaign. Red sprites are glows in the upper atmosphere tied to the presence of large lightning flashes, but not attached to the clouds themselves. In recent years, the ISS has afforded astronauts the opportunity to photograph a number of natural light shows produced at the tops of thunderstorms. A 2013 study by researchers from the French Alternative Energies and Atomic Energy Commission analyzed pictures from the NASA Crew Earth Observations Facility aboard the station. The pictures revealed 15 sprites and their parent lightning flashes. In August 2015, the Expedition 44 crew on board the station photographed red sprites over two different storms within three minutes of one another. First over the American Midwest, and then near the coast of El Salvador. These sprites reached as high as 62 miles or 100 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. All of these studies are contributing to researchers' understanding of lightning and thunderstorms, how they form and develop over time, and why storms produce different TLEs in different circumstances. However, according to Tim Lang, atmospheric scientist at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, TLE studies have been, to an extent, fortunate observation. We've gotten better at finding them, but it's mostly case-based analysis. NASA and partner agencies are advancing in their efforts to make continuous storm observations. NASA's Lightning Imaging Sensor, or LIS, was installed on the International Space Station in February 2017 as part of the DOD Space Test Program. LIS on the station is the latest in a line of instruments used to locate and detect lightning over a large region of the Earth's surface. The Atmosphere Space Interactions Monitor, or ASIM, will be installed outside Europe's Columbus Laboratory on the ISS later this year. Torsten Newbert, ASIM principal investigator, says, The instruments will monitor thunderstorms and their effects on Earth's atmosphere, gathering information about blue jets and other TLEs, as well as flashes of X and gamma rays. This and ASIM will be providing data that gives researchers the opportunity to analyze storms from both below and above. All of these studies are adding to our knowledge of how storms evolve and change, helping improve storm models that could lead to better predictions and forecasts. For more science from above the clouds, visit www.nasa.gov station. For electrifying updates, stay tuned to science.nasa.gov. The food for the crew on the International Space Station is carefully chosen for its nutritional value and then specially packaged and prepared to make it easily accessible in a weightless world on orbit. Could the same food feed the needs of people here on Earth? Well, we conducted an experiment to find out how well uh, two regular people could get by eating nothing but astronaut food for a week. And it was a week that included a holiday weekend feast just because. Take a look at how well they fared. I've always
always thought like, oh my gosh, when you go to space, like you don't have to grocery shop for like six months. I think it's gonna actually put me on a schedule for eating. I am horrible at eating at all hours of the night. I miss lunch. Uh, we're also talking about like beverages. Like we can probably only drink powdered beverages or water. So nothing, no sodas. No sodas. Nothing carbonated. No. Yeah, no <laughs> it's just. I think it'll be a little bit more healthy than what I normally eat. Plus, I get to eat everything with tortillas, and I'm from yeah, San Antonio, yeah. so. <laughs> I will say we are doing this over a holiday weekend. We have huge barbecues and yeah. lots of great food, so I think I I'm gonna wanna eat some really good ribs and, you know, like fajitas. Solemnly swear to eat all of the astronaut food and not cheat. Never. Never. We're in this together, so if we feel Never, weak, ever, ever. we'll text each other, maybe. <laughs> We chose seven days out of the standard menu. You're gonna have uh, a protein, some carb, some fruit. The other large category of products that we have are thermostabilized products. As which is a, sort of like a military ration that we don't have to uh, refrigerate to, to keep fresh. Can't do them in a microwave because they got it looks oil. like something that can't go in a microwave. I was gonna <laughs> ask because I didn't want to find that out the hard way. Yeah. Um, we also have rehydratable food, which is this type in a vacuum pack where we have to add water either either hot or cold. We're going to give you a syringe. Oh, I don't um, like needles. And, and it comes with a needle. So this is you how carry you would rehydrate, too. okay? I don't think we would want to have that laying around our office. Can I take that to airport security? Yeah. <laughs> It is the day before we start the food challenge, and I just went to go pick up all the materials from our wonderful food lab. So they're all packaged and in my trunk. I asked them what I should eat as my last uh, real meal, and they said something fresh, maybe a salad. The problem is I was thinking nachos, so. As I suspected, I wouldn't have time to eat in the airport. I'm probably going to grab something to eat on the fly. Hopefully there's some tacos. So like I said, I was debating healthy or, uh, you know, not healthy. Of course, uh, I chose nachos. I did end up picking up some tacos, some shrimp tacos actually, with some rice and some beans. Um, I told you I love tacos. I think it's important to always choose nachos, so I'm gonna call this hashtag she chose nachos. She chose nachos, he chose tacos. So I have beef and mushrooms, rice pilaf, tomato and artichokes, and a wheat flatbread. I don't know about that. <laughs> I have grilled chicken, mac and cheese, vegetarian chili. We're in Texas, come on. <laughs> Cran apple dessert. Oh man, I already, remember she told us to tear it so there's no extra pieces of trash. Oh, so like if we were in space, so this like would this. all be floating around. Yeah. Everywhere. Once we open those packages, the food is what we consider to be liberated and it can just float anywhere. And sometimes you find yourself using your spoon or your mouth to, to chase around the food and make sure you get it all in your mouth instead of stuck against the wall or somebody's face. Let's heat up a bowl of water and set these green ones in there. Idea. Yeah. getting to be the right consistency, yeah. yeah. We might have not done hot enough water, too. That might be why it's not absorbing, like, sure. all the way. Okay, oh, okay well, this is good. <laughs> this is interesting. <laughs> it's not bad. Wait a minute, what was this? This, oh, this is, is good. good. Yeah, the artichokes and tomatoes mm -hmm. are good, too. Should I try and eat it like this? Yeah. Ooh. You should have just got straws, like, everyone. Right? This is making my day, like, this is a treat. I have cran apple dessert. This would remind me of home. Yum. So it's been a long day, but I did not get hungry at all. I had my butterscotch pudding as part one of my snacks. I was wondering if the workouts would be hard. They're pretty much the same. I feel really high energy and I didn't even have coffee this morning. I'm actually really excited about this chicken corn and bean. This potato medley actually looks like some potatoes with spices and melted cheese on it. I'm very excited to get some melted cheese texture up in here. Little butter cookies look really delicious and super bougie. So you'll see I have um, some Caribbean chicken, pesto pasta with some corn, tortillas, vanilla pudding, and some pears. I got a little bit better at actually making the space food today, but I punctured the, the actual corn. I cut through it, so I had to rehydrate it through the side. Um, so lesson learned, this smells absolutely 
delicious. It's my boyfriend's last day at his old job, so one of his favorite clients brought him these delicious, huge looking cupcakes, so none for me. Ooh. <laughs> Do you see that? This is science, y'all. So you can be a nurse now. I get <laughs> My mom would be proud. Like, mom, I'm doing nurse things today. <laughs> Look at this. Oh, okay. This looks like oatmeal. Do PR for NASA, they said. It'd be fun. <laughs> What are you having for lunch? What's your, your main thing? I have citrus salad, and then my main thing is fiesta chicken. Ooh, I love fiesta. Yeah, and rice, <laughs> yeah, yeah, rice with butter. And so tacos. I'm really excited because I think our food's gonna be warmer today. I, I agree. I think we did this right with some practice yesterday. <laughs> this is some smoked turkey. Like, <laughs> it smells funky. <laughs> <laughs> Corporate dressing. And then some cauliflower. I'm not a fan of this. Um, Today we're eating in the LBJ room. So President LBJ um, is who Johnson Space Center is named after. We should do a toast. To oh, we should. Johnson. Go LBJ. Woo! Woo. <laughs> oh, mine's closed. <laughs> and so here we go. Mmm, this is really good. This is the, the chicken noodles. Let's try some of this green bean. Oh, that could use some hot sauce. The lentil soup. Ooh, it's hot. Ooh, hot. See, um, these are actually my tortillas. Astronauts on board the International Space Station can actually eat tortillas, and it's one of the things that they like to do because you can pretty much grab anything that's floating in space with them. Two quick miscellaneous notes. I've been living a really scheduled life and waking up early and going to bed early because I've been having to wake up with enough time to make breakfast, and then I go to bed shortly after dinner just so I don't get hungry again. What? I think Dan has a burrito. <laughs> oh, I yeah. Jealous right now. I went for pee. And queso. Apples, fresh fruit. Which may or may not be organic. My snack was chicken in a pouch, so. <laughs> Mine was tuna in yeah. a pouch. <laughs> I was just at the mall and whew, that was a weak time because all of my friends I got some really good appetizers and when you're just all sitting around the table together it's I had to really stop myself a couple times to not mindlessly uh, reach for some of their chips or pretzels. What are you eating? Um, a cupcake. And what is Isidro eating? Space chocolate. Space chocolate. Yeah. How do you feel about the astronaut candy? Uh, Can you tell which one is the space food and which one is our regular Easter meal here? Hey guys, what are y'all making? Astronaut burgers. My family gets to eat this delicious grilled food, and I get to eat a kind of brisket, a space brisket, and baked barbecue beans. So we'll see how that ends up being. <laughs> See this? Oh, it's coming apart. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, Save the it's Monday, so we're done at Wednesday morning. We're really ready to be done. The weekend was hard. I was not able to eat any of the food that was at the festival. Um, I, there were some jalapeno corn dogs, and I'm like, that sounds so good. what is life right, right now? I, I can't even. <laughs> and we have curry chicken, green beans, and potatoes. The potatoes have been iffy, but these look better than some of the ones. Mm -hmm. Cream of mushroom soup. Oh. A little bit of India, a little bit of Texas with this countryness. I'm so ready for this to be over. Yeah, we're ready. We're I need my social life back. Yeah, no, I'm right. just... I'm having milk today. Powdered milk! Ah! You were nervous about the guests or the milk? I'm more nervous about the milk, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but something that I noticed while we've been eating this food is you have to have it really hot. On the space station, we put it in a kind of a, it's almost like an easy bake oven. Okay. Where you just, and that does make a really big difference. So, <laughs> I gotta admit, when I was making lunch this morning, I wasn't thinking this was gonna be on camera. <laughs> Leftover rice, some turkey. But it's uh, home cooked. It's definitely home cooked. <laughs> yeah, I was a big fan of the garlic paste. Garlic paste. That could fix anything. Okay, question. Can you chew gum in space? Yes. Okay, because okay. mm -hmm. garlic, you know, bad breath. <laughs> Any of my crew members. We would use what we call food glue. 
something. Oh, just okay. make, make up something. <laughs> Spray some olive oil in there to try to get everything to stick together a little bit. Yes. Or like I said, the garlic paste worked well for me. <laughs> what? When you got a few people with rice in their eye, then after that, you figure something out. <laughs> You know, it's a lot easier in space because we don't have to load the syringe. Like, if you were trying to measure out 250 milliliters of water or, or 100 milliliters of water, we literally just dial that number mm. and then press the button for hot or cold water. Mm. So talk to me about tacos in space. Tortillas, are they great to have up there? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it just floated on this plate. <laughs> Gosh, if we had salsa, we did have salsa sometimes. You could put that on there. The salsa will stick to the bread. You can use the salsa for other things to stick to the salsa. I'm from San Antonio, and I love tacos. So I told everyone I would make a space a taco. taco. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a little bit leaky, extra that moist. Happen in space. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't drip off the edges, it just makes a bubble. Gotta do the taco tilt. <laughs> Everybody knows. <laughs> oh. <laughs> good stuff. That's awesome. This was the Mexican scrambled eggs food lab. They know what they're doing. We have some scientists back there. So is there anything that you Ooh, we made it! Way better than the LBJ toast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite meal. I actually really liked a lot of the breakfast food. Um, and the shrimp cocktail was in fact very good. Ooh, shrimp cocktail. But the scrambled eggs in a taco. <laughs> Ugh man. Sorry. <laughs> Done. And maybe if I had a machine to kind of heat everything up. If I was sealed away from the outside world and I didn't have all those temptations, <laughs> maybe. Maybe if the food was floating around me, but I don't think I would otherwise. We could maybe do that. if I were an astronaut. <laughs> so I was debating, uh, this is the same debate I started with, <laughs> nachos or a salad. Get them both. I'll get both. I, I mean, should get listen, both. listen, at this point, yeah. I think we need to treat ourselves. Oh, for sure. But I can tell you, I really want some coffee. Yeah. <laughs> some nice, Regular coffee. hot coffee. Like a latte. I, I, I gotta get some coffee. And a soda. Yeah. <laughs> this is not easy, y'all. I'm telling you. If you'd like to get another look at any of the stories we feature today, check us out on YouTube and on Facebook. There are the addresses. While you're there, take a look at all the other great stuff you can find about NASA and America's human spaceflight program. And if you're interested in good conversation about space exploration, check out Houston We Have a Podcast, which features folks here at NASA talking about their work, their personal experiences on the job. New episodes post on Fridays. Today, June 22nd, my colleague Gary Jordan talks with Sarah Wallace about the tremendous advances that have been made in sequencing DNA on the station and what that could mean for the future of spaceflight. Go to www.nasa.gov slash johnson slash hwhap, Houston, we have a podcast. Uh, you'll find all the episodes there. You can also listen on iTunes and Google Play and SoundCloud. This is Mission Control Houston.